He played 77 tests for South Africa and 75 of those were at lock. He twice played loose forward and it was those two that he played at number eight that might be most remembered. Mark Andrews was a Springbok giant in every sense of the word, but in the space of seven days in 1995, he was asked to do a specific job by coach Kitch Christie, playing out of position in the back row in two of the most memorable and crucial games in South African rugby history. June the 24th marked the 25th anniversary of the Springboks winning the 1995 World Cup with a famous 15-12 victory over the All Blacks at Ellis Park. Mark won Curry Cups and a Tri-Nations title and played 94 matches in total for South Africa, but his name will always be synonymous with the class of 95. I'm Craig Gray, and it's a great pleasure to welcome Mark onto the Maverick Sports Podcast this week. have got permission of course has to be an injury replacement back it comes to Strensky up goes the kick up goes the wall Strensky has kicked his head and with two minutes gone in the second period of extra time South Africa's dream is alive once more and it's absolutely unbelievable the crowd has gone mad plays restarted it is very difficult to explain in words what exactly the 1995 victory meant to me. Mark Ellis coming back inside, but he can't hold it. Definitely a life changer. Scrum South Africa. Now surely the dream must have come true. Very blessed to share a platform with Mr. Mandela and to be the fortunate captain to lead such a wonderful bunch of rugby players. Back it comes to use van der Westhuizen. Little knock forward, but that's it. South Africa have won the World Cup. Having been back in international rugby for less than three years and having not taken part in the first two competitions, at their first attempt, they have stolen the crown. It definitely changed South Africa for the good. Francois Pina, as you can see, absolutely in tears. Mark Andrews, that was a message sent to us from Francois Pina, who famously captained the Springboks in that match, which changed your life forever. Welcome to the show. I'm sure you still smile when you see that. Thank you for having me on the show. And I must say, I never get tired of, of hearing that clip, especially because it reminds me of how we beat the All Blacks. And that's always a pleasurable <laughs> day in my life. So, you ever heard the end of it from Joel? <laughs> yeah. I actually had a chat to Joel yesterday. Every anniversary of the, the 95 World Cup win, Joel and I were roommates in 95. Right. And Joel either phones me and says, happy anniversary, or I phone him. It's a very special anniversary in our life. So that's something that as roommates, uh, we went through six weeks basically live in the same room together and going through the same highs and lows. So even though Joel hit that drop, it felt like I hit it. <laughs> well, I, 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 we, I think you were already substituted by that point, were you? Were you watching from the sidelines? Australia was on, or had you moved into the second row? I can't remember the exact detail. And, and, and no, I actually went off. I was, I, I played, I played, I think, as you mentioned in the intro, I played eighth man in that final. And I got away with playing eighth man in the semi-final against the French because we basically played water polo and water <laughs> polo was my main game at school. So I managed to swim around the field and, and hide away from any being exposed for my inability to play eighth man and understand the rules. But in the, in the final, it was a dry field. It was an open field against one of the most attacking sides in rugby. And I couldn't let you hide anyway. So it was a pretty terrifying experience. <laughs> well, it must have been a... We'll, we'll get into the detail of that. I mean, first of all, the World Cup. Let's go back a few years before the World Cup. You, you sort of burst on the scene with the, with the Sharks or Natal, as they were known then in the early 90s. And you made your test debut, if I recall, against England at Newlands after the box had been thrashed at, at Loftus. By, they weren't expected to, have lo to lose to England. They, they go down in 1994 to a Rob Andrew-inspired England performance heavily at Loftus. You get called in because the knives are out. Were you initially disappointed that you weren't chosen for the first test? In retrospect, it was probably a good thing, but at the time, Ian McIntosh was coach. Did you, did you kind of think you had a chance of call-up for that first test in 94? Yeah, I did, because um, in the 93, I'd made the Springbok side actually as a flanker to go to Argentina. And I played the, the three midweek games. Ruben Kruger was the, the flanker with me in midweek games. And I know that they were, they were 
in the line outs in those days, you couldn't have lifters. Mm. And I was probably the best natural jumper out of the locks I had at that stage. And line outs were a crucial part of the game as they are today. So I was kind of hoping that I'd cracked a nod um, in 94. But there was still a fixation on having huge second rowers. And you think of Flakes Versace, who I played with, was 135 kilograms. Kribbeth Visa was 128. And I weighed 114, 115. So at that stage, there was still a fixation of having these monster second rowers. And, and even though I had the heart, I didn't have the build, which was traditional for a lock in South Africa. So when I didn't get the call up, and I actually got selected to play in the president's team against the Blue Bulls as a curtain raiser. And I played with my cousin, Keith Andrews, uh, who played for Western Province at that stage. And we were sitting in the grandstand. Our tickets were right at the back of the main grandstand in the far corner. I mean, we literally had our backs to the back of the grandstand. And when the box started losing, I'll never forget Keith. I mean, we cousins. So he like, bumped me and said, hey, cuz, this is, a, this is a good one to miss. <laughs> and, and it was a good one to miss because the box, as you said, got smacked. And the press was screaming for changes and so was the public. And the next side, there were the next week, six changes were made. I got called up. And I got my break into the, into the Springbok side. And we beat the, the English um, convincingly in the next year to Newlands. And my career started properly. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember you had a storming game that day. I just remember it's – I've watched many, many test matches and they all sort of blur, but that one still somehow stands out. I just remember you picking off English line-out ball and, and the box won 27-9. And, I, I mean, I don't know if you were named official man of the match, but it, if, if there was such a thing in those days. But you must have felt good because that was a really good performance. Yeah, I did. And also, I was playing against a guy, Martin Bayfield, who was 2 metres 10. <laughs> and he'd been playing for England for a number of years. I'd watched him as a schoolboy. So for me, I was playing against guys. I wouldn't say he was my hero, but, but guys I'd respected and admired. And so I figured at that stage, we didn't have a, we, we had a, a, a reputation based on what had happened in the Springboks years before. I mean, we hadn't been playing international rugby for the last 10, 15 years. So to play against these guys, for me, they were unknown. I'd watch them on TV, but I, I'd, I'd never. I didn't have guys on the side who played against England many times who had experience. So we just literally went out there, threw our bodies at it, and just <laughs> played probably like men possessed. And it worked for us there. And then we went, we left the next, I think, two days later to New Zealand. And that's where I'd like to say I, I went from being a boy into a man because that was one of the hardest tours I've ever experienced in my life. Yeah, and I was going to get to that because obviously what transpired 12 months later is the Springboks played the All Blacks in the World Cup final at Ellis Park. But 94, you go on this New Zealand tour. Those tours don't happen anymore, sadly. I think for some of us, we think it's, uh, you know, it would be a nicer way to, to play rugby. But uh, that's, a, that's a discussion for, for later. But, but that tour to New Zealand, the Springboks lose it 2-0, lose the series 2-0. But it was a tight series. There was only a one score in it at any, at any moment. How, how much, although coaching ch changed and so on, how much did that tour ready you guys for what was to come 12 months later in retrospect? Well, Craig, that is a very important question because I don't think many journalists and rugby pundits actually understand that our, I think our win in 95 was built on what happened in 94 in New Zealand for those two months. And then at the end of the year, under Kitch Christie, when he went to Europe and we played against the five nations, I think the four nations, sorry, in, at the end of the year too, and, and again for two months. And those were hard tours. We played midweek games. We got bust from the top to the bottom of countries, both both those tours, the, the host nations made it incredibly hard for us. So we had a bond. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we had a bond as players and start fighting for each other. And even though we came from different provinces, you must remember, provincialism was a very big thing in South African rugby at that stage because in isolation, every province became almost like a country. Because I mean you played for your province. You weren't able to play for you weren't able to play for your country. So we had big provincialism. I mean, at, at meal times, the, the non Transvaal guys would sit in one table, the province oaks would sit in the one table, then the English guys would all sit together at their own table because there was Afrikaans, English things. So we were a very divided rugby nation at that stage. And 94, and I don't think with the All Blacks, and well, of course I didn't understand that, but by making the tour so damn tough for us, they actually forced us to come together because we had no one else to allow. We had to just bond as players. And when 95 came around, we were a team that had learned to stand together, fight together and back each other. And I think that had a lot to play in our ability to, to overcome a whole lot of setbacks in the 95 World Cup and losing James Dalton and, 
and the, the incident against Canada and just the, the pressure that we were under constantly in South Africa to, to win. But because we'd, we'd, we'd gone through all this pressure for four months together the year before, I honestly believe it bonded us into a, a, a very strong, psychologically strong unit. Yeah, and I think there's some parallels with the 2019 win. I mean, Rassi Erasmus put so much thought in beating the All Blacks in New Zealand in 2018 and again in 2019 in the, in the Rugby Championship. And they did that in 2018, famously in Wellington, the 36-34 win. And got a great draw in 2019 when Chesney and Colby scored that late try. And those two psychological little blows, they, they might not have beaten the All Blacks at the World Cup opening game, but everyone knew that game didn't matter in, in, in the greater scheme of things. But what the Springboks did do was learn how to win away from home in those two games in 2018 and 19. And I guess the parallels are similar to what you guys went through in 94. Absolutely, Craig. I, I mean, people, are, unless you've played the game at that level, it's very hard to understand what the effect of a game against the All Blacks uh, six months before, four months before, does to a team psychologically. Because you have to be competent and you have to believe and, and honestly believe that you can win. I mean, I've played in some Springbok sides where when we went through, <coughs> excuse me, went through some disastrous coaching setups where you ran into that field knowing that you couldn't beat the All Blacks. You just didn't have the players. You didn't have the coaching structure. You knew you couldn't win, and and sport is an incredible thing. You have to believe, you have to honestly believe that you are going to win. And I think in, in the side last year, in the 2019 side, they believed they could beat All Blacks. Even though they lost in the opening game, because they'd done it and they and they and they dominated them in stages in the games before that, they knew and believed they could win. And we were the same. In the Test series in '94, we lost, I think, a total by five points. Um, those two Test matches, we knew that that if Things that bounced the ball, we weren't intimidated by them physically. And the All Blacks were tough. I mean, you had some of the toughest human beings who played rugby in those days. I mean, Richard Lowe, I think he's probably serving a life term for murder in New Zealand now. And he was one of the softer guys on the side. I mean, I mean you, had, you had some brutal human beings. Uh, but then again, we also had, we had some tough guys. And, and we learned to stand up and we believed that we could dominate them physically and we could beat them with our skills. And that transpired in, in for us in '95 and for the box last year. Well, going you know, forward, that tour obviously leads to the the '94 tour to New Zealand. Despite the fact that you ran the All Blacks close, Ian McIntosh is sacked by Louis Late in, in typical Louis Late uh, yeah. subtle fashion, you know. And Kids Christie comes in now as a as a Sharks guy. You must have gone well. Does this affect? Was there a nervous moment for you? Did you think, well, now that there's the Transvaal coach as it was then, and, and you know, let's be honest, Transvaal had been the dominant provincial team in 93, although you guys, I think, had made the Super Rugby final in 94, Super 10 as it was then. But Transvaal had been the sort of preeminent side, especially in 93 under Kitch. Did you think, oh, my chance of making the World Cup squad has been diminished because Ian Mack's gone? Absolutely, Craig, without a doubt. I mean, I, I was unfortunate enough to play, I think, seven different Springbok coaches in my career, in my 10 years in the Springbok. So when Kitch came along, everybody knew that Kitch was a Transvaal man. And, you know, whether, whether you like Kitch or dislike Kitch, he was very open about the way he chose his sides, the way he chose his captain. But, I mean, if you look at Tion Strauss as our eighth man and then in the 95 year, Tion Strauss was probably the best eighth man in the country at that stage. But Kish didn't choose him, and he, he told us straight out. He said, guys, I can't afford to have two leaders. Tion's a phenomenal leader, and, but France was my captain, and I'm not going to have some of you supporting Tion because he's a leader, so I've had to leave him out the side. It wasn't based on his playing abilities. So one thing about Kish, he was very direct and very, very open about his allegiances, and his allegiances were to the Transvaal side. They had performed for him. They would won the Curry Cup with him. They had... Kitch was going to go to his boys. And he made it very clear to me that I wasn't his starting lock. That for, as far as he was concerned, uh, Kubitz and Hannes were his two locks. So it's very tough to play under. I mean, the first time it, I met Kitch Christie, I mean, coming from Mac, who you call, this player is called Mac Mac. And he called me over and I walked up and I said, hey, it's Kitch. He looked at me and he said to me, I understand something, boy. You either call me Coach or you call me Mr. Christie. Don't ever <laughs> call me Kitch. <laughs> and that like, kind of I realized that I wasn't on this as Christmas list day. I wasn't going to get a card from Kish Christie in December. So it was very really unsettling. But you just always knew where you stood with Kitch. If you're a Transvaal player, the odds were you were going to play on his side. Uh, you had to play twice as hard. That's how we felt. 
So you had to call him <laughs> Coach or Mr. Christie. Uh, was that quite intimidating for you, Mark? Yeah, it was very intimidating because the relationship we had as players with Mac, you called him Mac. Um, it, it was just, it kind of broke the ice a little bit um, from the old school, having a, a master in charge, <laughs> the kind of mentality where you could debate and discuss things. And Chris Christie wasn't one of those men. Chris Christie didn't debate and discuss anything with you. He told you what he wanted and you did it. If you didn't want to do it, find someone else to play for. He was a very autocratic and dictatorial kind of um, dictatorial kind of uh, man. Mm. And the Transvaal guys were used to that, so it wasn't strange to them. But he used to have his own kind of favorites amongst them. But as outsiders, I remember he dropped James Small. And of course, Akra, he dropped Juba because they went and had a beer before a game. And in Natal, we used to do that. We used to go and sit in, in Dickie Muir's room, whatever, the night before a game in the hotel, and Dickie would order some beers, and we'd have a few beers and just talk and build a vibe. Yeah. <laughs> and the kids, Christy, that was automatic dropping. I mean, it wasn't even done. <laughs> so it was a very different culture that he had. Um, and the one thing he brought into the 95 side, he said the majority rules. So anything that we decide on, that we have to vote as players, whatever the majority decides on, the rest have to go with. But he had 13 chance for players on the side. So <laughs> nearly every single decision that he put to the vote, it was almost like a politician who already had the votes in his pocket. So... So he was a very, but it worked for us. I mean, he was the a smart man, there, Christy. <laughs> yeah, he was a smart man. But for Natal boy, it was very intimidating playing under him. Yeah, but he, he clearly gave you a fair shot because you pretty much established yourself as his first choice lock almost from the word go, didn't you? But you know, he never told me that, guys. And, and, and the crazy thing for me, like in the 94 tour to Europe, he called me before the game against Wales and we were playing, coming to the side, we were playing Neath, I think. No. And he called me and he said to me, listen, Andrews, you haven't been performing and this is your last chance. Otherwise, you're out of my test side. So you better perform this weekend. That is a discussion. Wow. So, so, and after the game, I mean, we won by about 60 points. They were the Welsh champions. I'm trying to think of the side. But anyway, and uh, he hardly ever came to me after the game and like shook my hand and said, well played and, you know, like, well done. So, so you, I always played with like an element of fear around, around Kitch. I always felt like, he always expected more from me all the time. So I, I never had that sense of the coach backs me, I, I'm his main lock, whatever. It was, it was always like I was on, on the line of being chopped. So you can imagine in 95 when I get called in to, to get asked if I can play flank. I just thought, okay, he's, he's basically going to fulfill what he always wanted, Kubis and Hannes playing lock. Yeah, I mean, that discussion we must get to in detail in, in due course. But So 95 comes around, you guys are ready. The world's coming to South Africa. Also in the background, rugby is changing. Rugby is going, the talk of professionalism starts around about <laughs> April, May. How aware were the players of, of those sort of discussions, besides just the rugby, about you know, some sort of new structure? Great. To some of the players, that's all they were aware of. You must remember the whole pack of, and again, I mean, it's a fascinating thing if, if you were able to study um, South African rugby in the 90s, is that... We were amateurs. Now, there were guys getting paid under the table. Guys were, were getting bought to come to provinces and their deposits on their house were paid. And, you know, there were all this underhanded stuff to try and to try and track players to different provinces. Mm. Certain players were getting paid by, in envelopes after games and some guys were, had get like, set up jobs, but they never actually went to them, but they got paid a salary. So it was all, all murky cloak and dagger stuff. And then the whole talk about Packer creating a, a professional league for rugby and paying the players. So you, so you can imagine what some of the players who weren't academic and didn't go to university were, were battling. The guys didn't have much money, but they gave so much of their time to train and to play and to, and, and this, some of them were just costing their money. So when this talk came about of earning stupid amounts, so before the 95 World Cup in South Africa, I can remember the shock. There was, there was almost every training session was a discussion about about this new professional league that was coming, which was a huge distraction. Yeah. And then the night of the World Cup final, we effectively were, were told by, by, by the, the senior players that we're all going to be millionaires because Packers put the money up and it's going to roll. Well, if I could jump in there, I, I spoke to Edward Griffiths uh, recently about that. And, um, you know, he was, for those listeners that don't know, he was the South African Rugby Football Union, as it was then. He was the CEO. And he apparently called a meeting with you guys after the World Cup final. You had just beaten the All Blacks to talk about the contracts. And that's why you were late for the official function at Gallagher Estate, because you had to have a meeting. Because he said it was the only time he would have you all together. And he, and he urged you not to sign anything yet. Don't sign any contracts. There's lots of contracts floating around. Please don't do anything. Is that how you recall it? 
Yeah, absolutely. I remember that. I remember in our team room, all the guys were drinking champagne and he was trying to get the guys to focus. <laughs> and, and the guys was obviously off winning the World Cup and champagne flowing. They didn't give us stuff, but they, they, we'd won the World Cup and we were about to start earning serious money from rugby, which, which a lot of the guys at the end of their careers needed. So, yes. And, and then after, after the World Cup, we probably had four, we five weeks of chaos in that. Mm. That's when Francois and Louis Lake were, were having discussions and debates and to try and now convince the side, because everything hinged on what we did as the World Cup winners. If we were to go back, the whole world probably would have gone along. And they knew that. So they had to, they had to keep us to, to stay with the existing structures. So, I mean, they, they took us to Gallagher State. Not Gallagher, yeah, Gallagher State, I think. About four weeks later, where we actually had to sit in a room and put our hands up and vote to decide if we were going to move to the Packer structure or we were going to stay in the existing international playing for your country and the game game professional. Was it only the Springbok World Cup winners in that meeting or were there other provincial players involved as well? Only the World Cup winners. So yeah. it, it was the 28, because what happened, so, so, so few, or sorry, I'm not sure what name they had at this so stage. Sofu at the time, I think. So, yeah, yeah Sofu. They came up with, with, with contract structure to match what we would have earned again at Packer. Yeah. But the problem was, is that only we were going to earn what Packer was offering. The rest of the players were going to have to fight for whatever was left over amongst TV rights uh, if the structure stayed the same. Mm. And there was huge animosity. I mean, when Juba and James Moore now went back to the Sharks to our training session that, that next day, we weren't allowed in the change room. The Sharks players locked us out the change room and we had to get changed outside in the warm-up area and they wouldn't talk to us for a week. Wow. They didn't want us to play for them in the next game because they said that we'd sold them out. And we probably had. I mean, but again, we had a two-thirds majority rule. Francois had convinced the, the, the transfer guys, I think, beforehand to, to stay in, in that structure. And they voted for it. So as I tried to explain to, to the players at that stage, the Sharks players, our vote was irrelevant because we, we didn't, whatever the transfer guys were going to do was going to happen. Yeah. As it turned out, Late signed the deal, and Sanzo had just been formed. They signed the deal with, with Rupert Murdoch's news call for $555 million that basically gave everyone, you know, created a professional structure where everyone got paid. Maybe you, maybe under that structure, you ended up earning slightly less than you might have under Packer, but at least everyone got paid. Do you think, in retrospect, it was probably the better way to go? Absolutely, Craig. I mean, I couldn't. And the one thing that, 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 that I think changed it for all of us um, to, to start the existing structures was you, we, the Springbok name belonged to South African Rugby. South African Rugby then wouldn't, be, they wouldn't exist anymore. So we would have been playing for the South African Volibus. I don't know what, what name we would have been mm. playing for. But, but there's such history if we played in the Springboks. And I think the same thing in New Zealand and Australia and England. The guys wanted money, but ultimately you want to play for your country. You want to play for that jersey that has pedigree, that has history, that has meaning. And and for all of us after having won the World Cup and, and how much that Springbok jersey meant to us, especially a lot of a lot of the guys who hadn't been able to play in their prime in their careers from isolation. That jersey just meant so much. And to give up that jersey, it, I think for other guys it became more than money when we sat down and actually spoke about it. It, it became we wanted to create something special, and we had. And we wanted young boys in this country to strive to play in the Springbok jersey. So that was the, the money side of it. But back at the tournament, you, you must have felt the pressure. I mean, South Africa was hosting the world. Uh, and I, I imagine you met Nelson Mandela a couple of times before the, the famous day on the final. Just what were your recollections? How were, aware were you of the sort of political significance of what you guys were doing? In the greater scheme of things, uh, yeah, maybe some players were more aware than others. Were you quite conscious of the fact that this could be a turning point for the country? I'm sitting there smiling because uh, 25 years later, I'd like to think that I was astute enough to actually be aware, but I'd be, I'd be, I think I'd be lying. All I wanted to do was play rugby and play rugby for my country. So I, I kind of had an idea. I was 23 years old. I think I just turned 23. I knew it was big, but for me, it was about red being beaten the All Blacks. Uh, I'll never forget, and I, I'd have to share the story with, with, your, with your listeners. The first time we met Nelson Mandela was at Silvermine training, or uh, Silvermine base in Cape Town. And he flew in his chopper and he landed, and we were all inside the hall. And we hadn't been told who was coming to see us. We sort of told, bring our tracksuits, and we shower there, and we were going to stay, and, and we were going to, and we thought, ah, oh, we're going to meet some dignitaries and, uh, you know, all that kind of hype that goes with it. And we got tired of all the, the sideshows. Mm. And next thing, uh, we had a helicopter. But when we arrived there, 
I'll never forget, there were like snipers on the roof, on the roofs. There were guys with dogs. And I remember one of the saying, yes, it's Alex, check the security they've got for us. And we didn't realize it wasn't for us. It was for Nelson Mandela, who was about to arrive at the end of our train session. And next thing, this chopper landed, and we just heard this noise, and the door opened, and Mona Duplessis walked in with Nelson Mandela. And But we'd been told to like line up inside this hall. And he walked down, and he met, shook every guy's hand. And I remember, as the light in the side, I was right at the end with management and the physios and the and the, the baggage <laughs> master. That so, and he came to me, and, and I speak also, and I, I grew up in the in the Eastern Cape, and his home is not far from Elliot, where where I grew up. So I greeted mm. him in Corsa and he stopped and, and we chatted a bit in Corsa and then he shook the rest of the guy's hands and then after he'd shaken the last um, the official's hand, Mornay turned around and I'll never forget this and he said, uh, Miss Mandela, would you like to have some tea? And he said, I haven't finished greeting everybody yet. And I can remember thinking, well, there's no one else. Mm. But at the back of the hall, there were two African ladies who were standing with their brooms and they were, they always just wanted to see Nelson Mandela and they weren't supposed to be there, but they'd swept the, and then they'd hidden in the corner yeah. and he saw them and he turned around and he walked all the way to the back of the hall and he spoke to them in course. I asked them where they come from, where their homes are. And then he thanked them for looking after the spring bucks and cleaning and making sure the hall was clean for us. Not for him. He thanked them for looking after us. And then he walked to the table to have tea and we were all like, like, like bees around honey, we all like hovering around just like to, to be near the man. And and he got to the table and before he asked for tea or anything else, he spoke to both the ladies and he asked them again where they're from. The one is a colored lady, an African lady, and he spoke Afrikaans, he spoke Kosa. And then he thanked them for looking after the spring bucks. And I can remember thinking, my God, I mean, what a human this man is. I mean, no other world leader would actually look at the small people in the room. And I think it's what just for me, I was like, hold on, this is this is like something special. I mean, he's really something special. Yeah, that's an incredible story. I've never heard that one before. I mean, we know that he landed at Silver Mine, but we've never we've never heard that. But yeah, Mark, and 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 I guess that must have just yeah, even though you you were playing rugby and that was your primary focus, there must have been somewhere in the back of your mind just a little light switch must have gone on with that. Yeah, okay, you know, but off that, I mean, remember it was before the, the opening game against Australia, so. The whole hype hadn't really, and we hadn't been exposed to it yet because we've been stuck in Cape Town. We've been trained at the Army base or, or the Air Force base, I think it is, whatever base it is. And we, we were kept away from people because they wanted to keep the hype away. It's exhausting smiling and photographs and autographs. And so they wanted to keep our focus. But as the World Cup progressed and we went to Port Elizabeth and then we went to Durban or to Johannesburg and then back to Durban for the semi final, we were obviously exposed to, to more and more people. And then we started to understand that it wasn't just white South Africans who, who traditionally supported rugby. Every single South African that we encountered in the hotels, in the train fields, driving to the train sessions, black, white, Indian, didn't make a difference. They were shouting, waving, supporting us. And then all of a sudden you start realizing, hold on, what Mediba was saying about South Africa, this is really, really bigger than us. It, this is about something it's it's about unifying our country so world cup starts first game australia world champions and that's what a lot of people have forgotten i think in 25 years we all think about the all blacks in the final but australia were the reigning world champions and probably the best team in the world going into that tournament weren't they absolutely they also had all the big names i mean the all blacks in australia had had the big names the established sides i think in that opening game against australia I, I, if, I could be wrong, but I think we had like 75 test caps amongst the whole side or, or maybe 125. And Campisi and Michael Lana together had more caps than our whole squad. So it just gave you an indication of the experience that the Australians had. And they were a great side. They really were. But I think that we just caught them by surprise. I think just that physically and mentally we were tougher than them on the day. Yeah, it was an emphatic performance. We won't go into all the all the massive detail. I mean, the Romania game, which I don't think any, almost anyone who either wasn't at the stadium or played in the game can remember it much. I mean, we know the box won twenty one eight, but I, I was actually writing an exam at university that day, so it's the one game I never saw, and I still haven't ever seen it. So you probably didn't miss much. Sounds like a good one to miss. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> And then Canada. Yeah, the Battle of Buti Rasmus, which had all the, yeah, the lights going out. Apparently, the lights, went, uh, the lights tripped before the game, and, and that caused a delay. But apparently, when you guys were training in the week, uh, it, it happened as well. Is that correct? 
I seem to think so. But Kitsch Christie had two sides. Before the World Cup, he sat us down and he said, guys, we're going to have two sides there. We're going to have the green side and the gold side. The green side is going to play the midweek games, effectively. And the gold side is going to play the opening game, quarter, semi, and final. So in, there were a couple of guys, obviously, because the numbers, I think there were only 28 players. So there were some of the guys had to be involved in the midweek games from, from the main test side. But those of us who weren't involved were kept almost away. So the, those train sessions, if I remember, we went and did fitness and trained away from the, the, the midweeks um, side because Kitch wanted to keep like a different mindset and a different, even though as a squad we were tied together, he understood, I think, that the pressure of being involved in every game can drain you, to, especially when you come towards the, the playoffs. So I actually think that we went and played golf on the Friday, those players who weren't, who weren't involved in the game against uh, Canada. Canada happened, James Dalton got suspended, Peter Hendricks got suspended, but you go into the quarterfinal, Chester Williams comes in, which is a great moment for, for the country, and he <laughs> scores four tries, emphatic victory, and you probably got to where you expected to get to, the semifinals. What was your reaction, what, what was Kitch's thinking? Did he give you any tactical reason why he wanted you to play loose forward or did he explain it to you or just tell you this is how it's going to be? He, he kind of explained to me. I, I think I've told the story so many times, especially after 1995 and every year it's a kind of reunion thing. But, but, but I'll tell the story quickly because I think it's, it's quite a humorous story and, and, it, and it highlights the kind of man Kitsch Christie was. It was a Sunday night after we played against um, Samoa and we were standing on the Sunday side hotel in Johannesburg and Joel Stransky and I were roommates. And the, the room phone rang, Joel picked it up and then we come and see you. He turned to me and he said, geez, the morning wants to see in his room. And that is normally a bad sign because <laughs> if you were in the side and you got told to go to the manager's room, they were probably going to break the news that you weren't in the, in the test side for that next week. If you weren't in the side and they called you, it was great news because they were going to break the news to you that you were going to be in the test side. So yeah. I've gone on the passage thinking, geez, I can't believe it. I think he's actually going to drop me. Because I understand what I said earlier about Nain Kitch wanted Kurbis and Hannes as his locks. I mean, he, 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 it wasn't a secret to us that, that that's who he wanted as locks. In his side. So I get there, knock on the door, open, and there's Kitsch Christie, was Kitsch Christie, Mornay, and Casey, our backline coach. And Kitsch doesn't beat around the bush. He just says to me straight, he called me Marky in the diminutive. I'm not sure why, my mm. size I am, but, but he still called me Marky. <laughs> so he said to me, Marky, can you play flank? Now I remember I played flank for the Springboks in 93 in Argentina, but I mm. hated it. I don't think I played very well. I'd never played it before in my life. So I said, no, coach, I can't play flank. So you sure? I said, oh, coach, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I can't play flank. So, oh, pity. Okay, thanks. <laughs> like, and I was like, yeah, no, okay, thanks. You can go. I walked out and I walked back to our room and Joel, my roommate, was, was sitting in the bed. And as I walked in, he was like, and I, are you playing? And I said, geez, I don't know, Joel. So what do you mean? I said, well, coach asked me if I can play flank. He said, what do you say? I said, no. He goes, oh, geez. I said, what do you, what, what, what do you mean, Joel? He said, China, you know he wants to play Kubis and Hannes' locks. So <laughs> he was just trying to probably give you an opportunity to play flank. Jeez, I've stuffed this up. Yeah. <laughs> and then I promise you, 15 minutes later, the phone rings. But I'm too scared to answer it. <laughs> Joel picks the phone up. He goes, uh, yes, Mona, yes, I'll, I'll tell him to go see you guys. He said, they want to see you. And I thought, okay, it's over, it's done. And I can remember walking on that passage. And for those of us who got caned at school, it was like going to the headmaster's office to go and get, a, get, to go and get six for being caught bunking. That terrible feeling that you just know it's doom and gloom and I'm, I'm standing there trying to compose myself thinking uh, how am I going to tell my folks in my boots who all got tickets for the semi-final or driving up from Elliot to Durban that I'm not going to be playing I remember knocking that door open up and catch sex and he said hey Marky can you play it's man <laughs> and, I, and I always joke and I say maybe a tight four but I'm not that doffer eh? so I said yeah coach I can play it's man eh? and he said can you play it's man I said coach what's my favorite position man seriously <laughs> And he turned to Mona, and I don't know if Mona ever remembers, but he tapped Mona on the leg and he said, Mona, I told you, he's built like you. You were a Springback legend, eighth man. He, Mark, you'll be, you'll, you'll be fantastic, eighth man. I said, Coach, I'll be fantastic. He said, Okay, thanks, man. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he was up, beat, and I, like, I, was, like, I still stood there, and he said, Okay, you can go. I'm like, well, I walk out, close the door. You know, it's like when you expect to go and get Kane six, and they, the headmaster tells you he's making your head boy for next year. It's like that kind of feeling. And I'm walking in the passage, feeling like a bit stunned. And I walked in and Joel was pacing around the room. And he said, hey, rooms. And I said, I don't know, Joel. He said, what do you mean you don't know? Are you in the side, out the side? I said, I don't know. Seriously. He said, well, what do you mean? What happened? I said, no, well, coach said, can you play it's man? 
He said, and uh, what do you say? I said, yes. He said, can you? I said, no. He goes, well, why did you say yes? I said, China, you told me he's not going to play me lock. He's really asked me if I can play flank. There's nowhere else I can play. So I said, yes. <laughs> so he thought, okay, well, surely he's not going to choose me eighth man because there's no way. So. <laughs> choose God. And that doesn't say another word to me at, after breakfast next morning in our team room. And Titch Christie announces the Springbok side. And he goes to the side, and obviously the locks are first, and he calls Hannes Stradem, Kubitz Vista, and I go, oh, Jesus. Mm. Ruben, Ruben Kruger, Francois Pinar, and he goes, Mark Andrews. And I promise <laughs> you, I, I, and I've said to the guys before, and, and then I probably don't admit it, I said, but nearly every player in that team turned around and looked at me like they just found out who the team kleptomaniac was. And they looked <laughs> at me, and they were, like, they were as shocked as I was. And, and, and I, I just, the one, the one important thing, though, is that afterwards, I stood up and I, and I lost my nerve. And I just thought, you know what, I can't put my interests above my country and my team. They just show sure I want to play, but I, I, I can't be dishonest about it. And I went mm. up to Kitch, and, and Kitch and Mourner were standing at the whiteboard. And the guys were walking around, shaking him with his hand, like, well done. Like, the guys weren't really shaking my hand. They were, like, more in shock. And, <laughs> um, and I went, to, I went to, to Kitch, and I said, Coach, I'm sorry, but I, I, I can't play it, man. He said, but you told me you could. I said, you're a coach, but that was under 15 at school. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> guys, guys. So, and he said, guys, hold on a second here. We'll leave for training half an hour later than planned. Rudolf, Francois, Monet, please just come out to the whiteboard. And in that, in that half an hour, I'll never forget, they had a whiteboard and a pen. And they started telling me what my, my, my lines were defensive. Because remember in those days, your eighth man stood off the scrums on defense. He didn't have to be bound in the scrum. So your eighth yeah. man played a huge role in defense. And, and I, I panicked. And Rudolf Charlie, he'd been dropped for me. So you can imagine how terrible he felt. Mm -hmm. And he helped me. Francois, Mornay Dupassi, and they stood there and they taught me basically my heart, basically taught me how to play eighth man on the whiteboard half an hour before training. And Kitch, and, and Kitch said to me, he said to me, Marky, you'll be great. Don't worry. He says, you'll be great. So to answer your question, no, he never really explained to me his reason. Only, only afterwards, when he said to me, I needed to mess up the French lineout. They had Benazi, they had Olivia Ruma, they had a big lineout, and he said, we only had you and Kobus. And he said, because we had Francois, Ruben, and, and um, Strali, and Strali is a big guy, he's not known for his jumping prowess, and he said, we, I had to bring in Hannes, who's a better lineout, who's probably our, be our second best lineout option. And it worked. In that, in that French game, I think I won three or four of the French lineouts. So then Kitch was absolutely convinced that was the reason why we won. So I had to play there in the final, which was terrifying. Well, I mean, in, in that semi-final, of course, most people remember it was a swimming pool, as you said earlier. And so I suppose from a defense structure of the game was all over the place because of the conditions. It, it probably wasn't a very structured game as you envisaged it. But you got through it by hook or by crook, and there was a, the moment with the Benazi try, which probably was short. Yeah. It wouldn't have been given by the TMO even today. But I think Ruben Kruger was given a try that was probably not a try. I think he famously said, because in the final, Ruben Kruger barged over. Correct. We all thought that was a try. And he said, when someone asked him a year later, he said, well, did you score the try in the final? He said, well, maybe you should ask me, did I score the try in the semifinal? <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I suppose it all enough. evens out in the end. Eh? <laughs> Absolutely. In, in the, in the, in the semifinal, I was actually lying on top of Ruben, and I had no idea if he had scored because there were so many bodies on top of him. But I can remember just showing, throwing my hand in the air, screaming like I was so convinced he'd scored. I couldn't see a thing. Mm. And the referee gave the try. But in the final... I picked the ball up at the back of the scrum and to go for the line. I got tackled short of the line. Ruben picked it up. I got up. And by the time I got there, I'm absolutely convinced that he'd scored that try. Yeah. So, But he's right. I don't think even he's convinced that he scored the try in the semifinal. But, guys, yeah. let's not go back there. No one's going <laughs> to change this result. <laughs> so we right. won. The day of the final. I mean, you guys are obviously in a very specific headspace. It's a massive game. Biggest game in South African rugby history, probably. Were you aware of the Boeing that flew over? And, and just what was your reaction when you saw Madiba in a, in a Springbok in Francois Pinot's number six jersey? Yeah, so as far as the Boeing, we obviously heard it. We were in the change rooms uh, still warming up and we heard this bloody thunder. I mean, if this had happened after 9-11, we'd all, we'd all be in big trouble because uh, we thought that Boeing would have been. But at, yeah, we just heard this roar and it was a terrifying. We, we were confused. We didn't know what the hell it was. Until some of the reserves came in before and said, geez, guys, the SA flew a Boeing that says, go book underneath it over, over the stadium. And we were like, what? Like, you're kidding me. So I can remember us being a little bit excited about that, but we never actually experienced it and saw it. We just heard it. And then when Nelson Mandela walked into our change, we also didn't expect that. And he walked in wearing Francois' jersey. 
And we all have our own recollections. And I, and I said one interview yesterday, I think we all romanticize periods like that in our life. And we think we, we thought things or said things or did things which are probably um, better than they actually were. But I, I can, for some reason, remember Nelson Mandela talking about our destiny and just saying to us, gentlemen, you know, this is your destiny. You're going to win this game because South Africa needs you to win this game. And it's your destiny to win. So just go out there and play as hard as you can, and we will be champions. I remember something to that, to that kind of effect, and I remember being quite calm about because obviously my nerves were going, were almost, un, I couldn't control them at that stage, especially having the fact that I was playing eighth man, that I didn't have confidence in my ability to play eighth man. So I was a bit of an emotional wreck. And I remember after when he spoke to us, I felt like a sense of calm, like, okay, this is out of my hands now. This is, there's like, there's a destiny here, and it's, and it's actually got nothing really to do with us. It's what's going to happen, it's going to happen. And Nelson Mandela believes we're going to win, so we're going to win. Incredible, incredible. And we're not going to go, listen, we won't unpick the final blow by blow. I mean, it, it was, you know, watching it again, and I'm sure you've watched it many times, it actually was a hell of no, a I high quality. Well, okay. Uh, Craig, I've it's never a high watched quality game. game. <laughs> I've never watched that game in my life. I've really, I've never watched it. My dad, my late father, couldn't believe it. He watched it about two hundred times. <laughs> never had a bad day. I think he watched the final, but I've never watched it. I actually had a mate of mine phone me this morning, and he said, "Mark, you know, I sat all my children down yesterday, and the ones seventeen and the ones uh, 15, 16. And he said, I sat them down with my wife, and I watched that final. He said, I was there in that day. He said, I've never watched it." And he said, I can't believe what an incredibly hard game of rugby it was. He said, it was actually a phenomenal game of rugby. He said, it was. He, he, and he said, like, I have my own memory of the game being live. But he said, I didn't realize the impacts. I didn't realize the intensity of that game. He said, it was frantic. It, it was a proper test match. Take away the fact that it was a World Cup final. He said, that is one of, still one of probably the toughest all-black clashes I've seen in the Springboks in all these years. He said, I didn't realize it was that intense. You should watch it. Uh, you, you did quite well. I, I'm actually going to my <laughs> children. I, I have three children. I have three children who I still think don't believe that I actually was part of the 95 <laughs> World Cup. So maybe I always get a bit confused when I have all these every time this year. Like, why do people want to talk to you? Like, you just the old <laughs> fart. Well, they, what the hell do they want to actually talk to you about? But they, I, I think I'm going to, sooner than later, sit them down and, and as a family, we'll watch it. Yeah, well, I won't tell you what happens in the end, but enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark, um, uh, yeah, and, and you, you are always now bound by that. I mean, you, you achieved a lot in your career afterwards. Uh, you played 77 tests in total. You won a Tri-Nations. You beat the All Blacks. You, you, know, you had a great career. But somehow it always comes back to 95. And I, I mean, I, I'm sure you're not ungrateful for it in any way, but does it, do you sometimes feel hey, guys, I've done more in my life than just 95, or do you you wear that happily? No, you know, it, it is a very hard thing for me. It, it, it's something that I probably I've compartmentalized that period in 95. I was, I was young. I was 23 years old. I'd never experienced something like that before, and, and I think very few people do get experience something like that, which is so much bigger than they are in life. So for me, Every year, and, I, and again, I, I said to, to a journalist yesterday, I, I get more emotional every year that goes on about the 95 World Cup because I, I think I have the maturity now and, and, the, and the experience in life to understand what it actually meant to us as a country because it is so much bigger than us as players. And we didn't understand it at the time. I certainly didn't. So, yes, it, it's, it's a point in my life that is a defining point in my life because I became famous. I was an Eastern Cape farm boy. I was I, I had learned how to deal with with fame, which was which was so foreign to all of us. So it changed my life in, in good ways, some bad ways, but it, it was a defining point in my life. And I'd like to think I, I, I'm remembered for my whole Springbok career and my contribution to South African rugby. But I'm just incredibly privileged, and I, and I say this, and I don't say this to to, to try and be corny, but. Every year that goes past, I, I kind of understand how privileged I was to be part of that 95 because it wasn't just about rugby. It was about our, our country. And, and when I look back, I'm just so proud to have been part of it. I, I'm, I'm sad that I had a whiskey last night and I have it every, every, every year at this time to, to think of James and Eurus and Chester. And it just seems like every damn year, one more of us disappears and, and isn't around. But it's, it's just a very 
big occasion in my life. And yes, I, I have other things I've achieved in life. I've got three beautiful children. I can still fit into my 95 World Cup rugby shorts. I tried the other day. <laughs> so that, that, if you look at most of my teammates, that's a hell of an achievement because some of them... <laughs> Some of them couldn't fit into Kervis's pants and uh, that's saying something. So, so, yeah, but guys, and it's just, you know what, even though the, the rest of the country didn't play that game and I was just lucky enough to be on the field, the way you guys feel about 95 and, and being part of it and, and we were old enough to remember it, that's how I feel. It's almost like a movie I look back on and I go, yes, it is an incredible time for our country and just blessed that I was part of it. Mark Andrews, I think on that note, it's been a great pleasure. Thanks for joining us on the Maverick Sports Podcast. Thank you for having me. Keep telling the stories. They're great. And uh, good luck with uh, all your ventures in the future. Thank you very much. And thanks for um, giving the opportunity to uh, reminisce with you guys. Really great. <laughs> this podcast is made possible by our Maverick Insiders. Please consider becoming part of our Maverick Insider community, where for a nominal fee every month, you are supporting quality independent journalism. You also get some cool benefits such as Uber vouchers when the coronavirus pandemic subsides and engagement with our journalists thrown in. Please go to dailymaverick.co.za forward slash insider to sign up and become part of the Maverick Insider community. Also remember to sign up to our Maverick Sports newsletter, which hits your inbox on a Monday and never miss another podcast by signing up via your favorite platform. I'm Craig Gray. Thanks so much for joining us this week.